I'm Kurt Walnow, my uh, co-conspirator in this work, in the insider threat lingo. Brian Lindauer in the back, so it's his fault too. Uh, and uh, I'll refer to a, a paper publication at the end and give you uh, more particulars on who else uh, contributed to the effort. Uh, okay, so the title, am I right? The title of the talk is uh, Simulating Insider Threats as Dramatic Performances in Real Background Data. Um, the work, I can say, is uh, supported by DARPA Adams. We have the permission of the you know, program manager, who's Rand Waltzman. Uh, and uh, I'll have more to say about the details uh, as we go along. So, uh, so here's the, the research problem and our task. Um, the research program, Adams, is, is developing a next generation uh, insider threat detectors. The idea is to, to, to find out these bad actors before they've actually done, done the real damage. And uh, in contrast to a simpler approach, uh, sort of violation-based detectors, looking for you know, bad, bad patterns of behavior against a fixed catalog of, of policies. Uh, what, what Rand and DARPA Adams is doing is they're developing these so-called anomaly detectors, uh, essentially looking for patterns of mysterious behavior that aren't necessarily predefined or predisclosed to the detectors, but are manifesting in background data as anomalies. Uh, I've heard this described in, uh, metaphorically as uh, like searching for toothpicks in fields of haystacks. These are very, very, very faint signals of, of bad actor activity taking place within the background of overwhelmingly, uh, maybe large volumes of, of benign activity. Uh, lots of technologies being thrown at the problem in this program. Machine learning, uh, statistical data mining, uh, natural language processing, social network analysis, a whole, whole bunch of things. Uh, I, I won't be describing any of those in detail. That's not my, my job. And also, as you'll hear in a few minutes, it's uh, by intent uh, something I don't really know much about. So, and that's kind of interesting. Uh, one of the most amazing things about the program uh, is the resource that it has. And I don't know, for doing the research, I'm not sure how, how Rand did this, but we have uh, access to real data, real user data. Now, I'll say this just once and so I don't forget, and then I'll, I'll, I'll just assume that I've said this as a caveat. The user data that we're getting is all de-identified. It's all anonymized. Uh, there are strong security and safety and privacy protections in place. All of the data is managed in a secure facility. This is restricted access uh, to the facility. Uh, we call the facility Vegas, not because of where it is, but because what goes on in Vegas stays in Vegas. Uh, and, uh, and so that's sort of the caveat on it. And I won't mention that again. Just assume that uh, this is all as amazing as it is that there's some strong protections. So the data comes from a, an industry partner in the defense industry, about 5,000 users in a, in, a, in a business unit or a collection of business units. Uh, it's host monitored data, that's uh, data collected by users from computer use. So what programs they're running, what processes they've started, what files they've created, what devices they plugged in, who they sent mail to, who they IM'd with, what websites they browsed, lots of stuff like that. And in addition, some metadata about organizational structure, where they are reporting structures and so forth. Lots and lots of rich data. Uh, and lots of it. Uh, we get about 100 million events per month. And over the course of 24 months, well, you can add it up, I guess, about two and a half billion records. So it's, it's a fairly big chunk of data. Uh, now, our task, and look at this sort of conventionally, is uh, to produce threat overlays. So here's the idea. We have a, a, a graphic there, and I should step down, but then I'll, I'll probably be stepping up and down. So uh, the, uh, the lines represent users and time series data. The blue dots are, are you know, the monitored background data. And, and th against this background of user time series, we have to produce uh, synthetic threats. We're going to create insider threat data, and we're going to overlay it on top of the background data. So those overlays are, we're not going to touch the background data. We're not going to change it. We're just going to intersperse within the background data bad activity, right? And we're going to put it into 30-day windows, test windows, so that the, the background data plus the synthetic overlays combined are presented to the detectors. And we have a rolling 30-day window. We slide along to the next 30 days after 30 days, publish the answer key, and move on. Okay, that's what we do. That's our task. OK. Uh, now, the challenge. Well, what, what do we want to do as a red team? Well, we want to produce valid and representative threat samples. We want to have plausible and realistic behavior. We want to have useful test data for exploration, for test, for evaluation, all the good things. But oh, by the way, we're not going to tell you what features we're looking at, what we consider to be anomalous. We know what we are observing, but we're not going to tell you what features are really you know, considered anomalous because there are lots of them, and we're just not going to tell you. And uh, maybe it's because it's non-signature based detection, they're not even going to know. They're going to look for correlations that kind of emerge. Um, we're uh, not going to even have an explicit model of what the threat looks like. 
Uh, so from our point of view, we're, we're kind of in an open world situation. We don't have a fixed referent to define some of these qualities, like realism and so forth. Uh, we also have an open loop condition that we have to satisfy or we have to live within. We produce data, but we don't hear what the results were. We throw it over the transom, if you will. Uh, the only thing we'll hear about is if there's a problem with the data. We hear that quickly, and we did early on, but we haven't later. Uh, that's a good result. But we don't get measurement results. And the reason for that is, and for both of these really, is the risk of overtraining or, or biasing these detectors, focusing them in the wrong place. These are ex difficult experimental conditions to work in as a red team producer, but it's a tough challenge if you're building the technologies that are based on machine learning and anomaly detection. Um, now our approach to solve the problem, and this is going to sound fanciful at first, but I'm going to ground this in just a moment, is to adopt a notion of fictional narrative and dramatic performance. And I know that sounds a, a little strange, but I'm just going to point, uh, this is a surprising result for me too. I'm a technologist, so uh, there is quite a bit of, uh, of theoretical foundation to support the use of fiction and narrative in producing test data. It is, in the cognitive science world, well understood, I think, that narrative is the way humans orient themselves and construct their social realities. There's one paper in particular I think carries the idea to a logical conclusion for us that makes sense. Uh, it's by uh, Marr and Oatley, and uh, the title is A Function of Fiction is the Abstraction and Simulation of Social Experience. They go on to talk about abstraction, simulation, compression, packaging, sharing, and so forth. All of the things that we're really doing in the threat data. In fact, they talk about social simulation or fiction as a flight simulator of social complexity. So this is all kind of within that, that space. So in that, in that background, uh, let's see, let me just sort of relate I'm going to take the same terms that I used before, background, thread overlay, and so forth, and I'm going to relabel them. And this, the reference are the same, but the intentionality behind them is a bit different. For threats, we have stories. For, uh, for the actual threat data, we have performances. This is a presentation of a story in a, in a, in a medium and background. Uh, the medium is the threat detectors themselves. Uh, users aren't really users, they're actors who are going to perform our roles. The ones who are unmodified are extras. The ones that we modify are actually playing character roles. And background data is not passive. It is actually all the details, the myriad real and captured details of a fabula of, the, of this fictional story world that we're going to construct. And we're going to leverage it as realism a priori. So let me get this to be very concrete. I'm going to walk through this production process to give you an idea of how this works. So upper left-hand corner is our background data. That's the ground truth coming in that's been de-identified. Now in the lower left, we're going to create stories. These are stories that are like screenplay. We're actually using professional screenplay software now. That's kind of interesting and useful. Uh, now, where do stories come from? Well, they come from our domain expert. They could be coming from case files, which are already, by the way, in narrative form, which is interesting. Uh, they could be coming from headlines, and we've used some rep from headlines. And they can also come from background data itself, from the fabula. And that's interesting, and I want to talk about that just for a bit. The case I've got here is called Layoff Logic Bomb. And we were doing some research for developing a, a threat, and we observed in background chatter about a layoff action that was actually happening in the organization. Oh, layoff is a generative process for disgruntlement and other things. Our counterintelligence expert says, let's write a story about a disgruntled sysadmin who's going to get laid off and writes a logic bomb. When he leaves, he's going to blow up the bomb. OK, that's what we did. So we used the fabula, this, this real event, to create the story. And then we found a user in background to play the role who was a sysadmin who had sent emails about or IMs about this layoff, didn't seem too happy about it, and son of a gun whose data stream appeared to end about seven days before the window closed. We've got ourselves a winner or a loser. All right. And that's a kind of an interesting thing because we're really taking what's real and turning it into fiction, or we're taking what's fiction and we're turning it into something real. It's this kind of a very strange, strange hybrid, and it's a little bit mind-bending. But anyway, that's uh, subjective. Okay, so what do we do with the stories? We then take them and we compile them, if you will, into a simulation program. So on the top, I've kind of described logically what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to, find, we're going to find users to play, the, I don't know if you see this thing. Yeah, we're going to find users to play the role of these characters. So we've got you know, criteria that we define for characters, and we feed them to something called the central casting service, which we've evolved over time. And we take our stories, we compile them to user-level programs, and we we run them in a simulation environment, which is a virtualized, post-monitored environment to capture the data of these synthetic actors. And we're going to take these synthetic actors, the data we've gathered, we're going to combine them with the users that have been selected to just use our parts. We're going to blend the data so that it looks like it came from the users. We're going to blend their social behavior. We've done that in casting. We're going to blend their temporal behavior by making sure the actions are synced up in the right way. We don't get temporal anomalies, and we don't get overly dense behavior. We're going to do 
kind of a rule of thumb kind of things there. And then we're going to produce the combined thing into the threat window. And that's the 30-day uh, the performance, all right? Okay, that's this threat window there. Okay, now, that's the process view. Uh, there's a production environment view, and I think there's an interesting point to make here about uh, a consequence, a kind of a, an interesting and unexpected consequence of using dramatic stimulation as a kind of abstraction mechanism. Originally, all of our work was done in Vegas because that's where the data was. And this is what we hear from the insider threat community. Data's hard to get because it's very, very sensitive. Well, it turns out our, our stories don't depend on the data collection because we're recording it and we're simulating it on top of a simulated environment, virtualized environment. So we don't really care so much about what the detectors are doing. Well, we don't know what the detectors are doing. We're not even really particularly concerned about what the host monitors are doing. We're just going to let the host monitors produce the data they produce, like runtime code generation if you're into programming languages. We also uh, don't know about the technologies that are being tested. So we've actually liberated sort of the, the threats themselves from all of these details. And as a consequence, much of our production actually takes place now outside of the lab. So we're actually moving to the point where we could envision having simulation data, insider threat data, that could be developed once and run anywhere on any detection system for any detectors in any host monitor collection or any kind of uh, monitors without any particular concern about PII or the particulars of the data. And I think it's kind of interesting because it's an a, a unexpected possible way of using this threat data in production process. Kind of like almost like maybe Symantec releasing new threats of the week or something. Okay. What do we actually accomplish in terms of the tail of a tape? We've got 40 threat dramas we've produced. They cover all of the major categories, espionage, sabotage, theft, fraud, and so forth. We focus on character motives and character behaviors, greed, family crises, resentment, misguided idealism. All of these things show up in the threats we produce, conspiracies and loan actors, foreign agents, victims, and enablers. Uh, we can produce different performances, so we can take the same story and have different users perform it. We can do it in different background uh, threat windows. We can actually vary the behavior. So we have essentially a way to create families of related kind of uh, threat data. And it's, it's not bad. I mean, I think, at least from my, our point of view, we, we, because we're open loop and, and open world, we don't get much direct feedback, but we've had cons 20 consecutive months with no confirmed artifacts, no reports of artifacts. And this is notwithstanding the fact that these detectors are quite sensitive to finding these things. Key points, I guess. What I've given you is a heuristic dis a description of the work. It's the conditions of the work are open loop and open world, but I think it's heuristic that are rather plausible and interesting. Uh, we've had uh, a long run of publishing threat data on time and in budget. The researchers have produced some interesting papers. I haven't read them yet. I'm not supposed to, but I'm really looking forward to it. My last count, I saw 70, but I can't confirm they're all about it, Rand, because I didn't read them. <laughs> I promise. 90? 90. So that's a good measure of productivity. For additional information, you can see this paper. We've uh, only published one. We're, we're trying not to. We have been honoring the idea that we don't want to bias the results, but the program is going into its end game, and, and we'll see where this goes. So that's what we did and why we did it. Thank you.